Hopefully I can show you some of the tips and tricks that I learned doing oil changes over the years and make it a little easier for you. This really only happens when you're getting ready to try to work on something here in Kodiak. Ahoy there! So it's a beautiful uh, Saturday morning here in Kodiak. And so we're going to do an oil change today on the uh, 2015 RAV4. There's a ton of videos out there. However, it seems like you'd have to watch three or four different videos to actually catch all the different things you have to do. So we're going to see if we can pull it all together and have just one video for you to watch. A lot of people don't know with these Toyota RAV4s, they're all wheel drive. That means the computer determines where a wheel is slipping and it reacts to it. What that is, is that's a four-wheel drive lock. That's a magnetic lock that'll work up to 30 miles per hour. Now, in a situation like this, where we're sitting on a mixture of ice and snow, um, I like to use that lock so that I'm not jockeying around back and forth as I'm going up the ramps. And then go ahead and set the parking brake and put it in park, shut her down. Always remember to have a spotter because, you know, it's pretty easy to drive off those ramps. The other thing is, one thing I learned as a mechanic, always leave this window open. Which uh, reminds me, did you, ever, did you hear about the blonde who locked her keys in her car and it took her a week to get out? Anyway, yeah, you can't lock the keys in the car if the window's open. So, tech tip. To open the hood on a RAV4, it's just right here. This is a little plastic lever. Now, if this lever is hard to pull, don't pull it hard. These are made out of really thin plastic, and it's just got a really small cable behind it. If this is hard to pull, and you're not a mechanic, I'd recommend you find a mechanic rather than yanking on that thing, because if you break it, that's going to be a hassle. Yep. Okay, so to open the hood, you saw it on the inside, and up you go. Now, you've got a couple options of where to put the hood stick, or hood strut, whatever you want to call it. Depending on how tall or short you are, I've seen it where this plug is down here. And so, yeah, you can only put the hood right here and move that plug and put some sides in and that it comes out. Or you could just leave the plug out all together. But because I don't like the hood being really low, I always go to the second plug. So the hood's way up high. So that's another check tip. If you're tall, push these. Look at it. And only Toyota would come up with that. It's just a little button. And you can put it, you can just move it from there to here, this factory, it's down here. Put it up here, and then this thing is wide open. Now, this might look like one of the few Toyotas that actually leaks. I don't think it does. This was maintained by the Toyota dealer in Anchorage, and I'm pretty sure that they spilled. Um, because the leak hasn't gotten any worse since we got it, and I haven't had the opportunity to clean it either. The one thing about owning a Toyota, you don't look under the hood very often. Okay, this is something you may or may not have. This is an under hood light. These are really good for productivity. And you gotta remember, we're working outside here. So for what it's worth, if you're working outside, these are awesome. And a buddy of mine, a really good buddy of mine, used to own an oil change shop as well. And between him and what I learned in my past is make it really obvious that there's no oil in the car. First thing I like to do is check the oil and see what it looks like. Because whether you're doing this professionally or just doing it for yourself, you want to know, was there a problem here? Because last thing you want is for someone to bring a car in for a problem and then next thing you know it's your problem. So in this case, we have the two dots here and here. And as you can see, the oil level's right there. You can also see by the condition of the oil and the color, this oil's still in pretty good shape. But it's time for a change. Now, one thing you'll see with a lot of modern cars, and I always warn people about this, you'll see a lot of modern cars that say, you can go 5,000 miles, 6,000 miles, 10,000 miles. Change it every 3,000 miles or depending on where you are, set it up for a, a regular oil change schedule. Now here on Kodiak, it doesn't make any sense to change it every three months because we just don't drive enough. But even changing it every six months, well, actually, it almost seems excessive. But nonetheless, so what's the trick that I used to do so that I never sent a car out of the shop without oil? One. The dipstick, I'm going to leave it sticking out like this. If I close the hood, I'm going to hear the hood hit the dipstick. Yes, I'm going to have to buy a new dipstick, but I'm not going to have to buy a new engine. So with synthetic oil, you'll hear that it's got the longer oil change interval, and that is true. You know, for this car, 
Toyota recommends five to 6,000 miles when you're running synthetic like we are, 3,000 miles when you're running conventional oil. Um, because our time goes longer, that's why I'm running the synthetic. It's not because of miles. But really, in our case, what we have to worry about is the acid that forms in the oil. Uh, because there's, you've got rotating parts down there, and you've got bearings. You've got bearings on the crankshaft. You've got bearings on the connecting rods, which are this, these little sticks that go up to the pistons. Then you got bearings, wrist pins in there, which is another type of a bearing. All those bearings are lubricated by the oil, along with, in this car, dual overhead cam and variable valve timing. Uh, the variable, variable valve timing is controlled by these solenoids up here. So, in this case, the oil is critical to this car running properly. And you want to make sure that you keep fresh oil in this thing. It's a Toyota. Really, the only way you can kill a Toyota is to not do the basic maintenance. I am not doing anything up here right now. I'm still going to take the oil cap off. Why is that? Two reasons. One, when I look at the engine, I'm going to see, hey, there's no oil cap. Gives me an opportunity to clean it, take a look. I'm going to clean around it as well. It's got a nice reminder on here, 0W20 oil. And most modern cars do that. Back in the old days, they didn't. Which is funny because I think in the old days, people used to maintain... Their vehicles a lot more than people do now. A friend of mine sent me a, a joke on the internet. You know, the owner's manuals in the 60s and 70s used to tell you how to adjust the valves. And the owner's manuals in modern day cars just tell you not to drink the battery acid. I don't know if that's true or not. It sounds like it could be, though. Okay, so you'll notice right here, there was some dirt. That's because we live on a gravel. Well, we live in Kodiak. This thing's off-road more than it's on pavement. So I'm getting that all nice and clean. This is the gasket that goes under the uh, oil fill cap. And I'm getting that clean as well. It's funny because, uh, you know, as a guy, I wouldn't say I'm a clean freak. But when it comes to oil and anything mechanical, I am. See, then I'll go ahead and put the gasket back on. And this way, I don't have to worry about forgetting the gasket. Uh, do you have to worry about stuff falling into the, since you're outside? I do have to worry about stuff falling in a little bit, which is why this rag is going to go right here. And I just kind of tuck it under this plastic cover. And that way, because we do have a constant shower of needles coming down. So I'd like to set myself up to succeed. Now, I'm going to inspect the antifreeze from the outside this time because it's hot and pressurized. You don't want to be opening this now. I will be topping off the washer fluid because you top off the washer fluid with every oil change. And then over here, I'm going to be checking the brake fluid. And the brake fluid looks good. It's a little bit on the low side. Now, for what it's worth, if your brake fluid is going down slowly in a car that you drive a lot, you might not have an actual problem. It might just be that your brakes are starting to wear out. As your brakes wear out, the pads get closer and closer. It requires more and more fluid. So that's an indicator if your fluid level is getting too far down, that maybe it's time to take a look at your, uh, at your brakes. Okay, so and you got to remember, we live here in Kodiak, Alaska, so we've only got a few hours to get this done, start to finish. And I apologize because, of course, everything's frozen and everything's covered with spruce needles, but again, that's how it works in a lot of places. So the first thing I do is I lay out everything I need so that everything is where it's within reach. Plus, this serves as a reminder. Remember that, remember that, remember that, remember that. What I've got here is I've got a mechanical torque wrench. I've got 14 millimeter sockets, six point which if you have a choice between six point and 12 point, I say always go with six point. I really like six point because it's just, it's virtually impossible to strip anything. You'll need a three eighths extension because it takes a three eighths extension to get the filter off. I wanted to show you these because it's two different approaches, but both will work. In both cases, you want one that's about six inches long, three eighths. This one's got a half inch adapter just because I'm using a half inch wrench because it's all I had access to. I wanted to show you this as well, and I'll bring these up again later. A uh, little tool tip here. So this is a regular 3 8 extension. So when I put on the, the socket, I put it on, and it stays on pretty well. It takes a little bit of effort to pull it off. But if you've ever been working with like three or four extensions or working in something really far away, sometimes you get all these extensions lined up, you know, kind of like this. And next thing you know, everything falls apart. This extension is different than that one. This is a locking extension. I don't know if you can see that. See, if you look here, see that ball? It goes in, 
And then when I release this, it comes out and it stays out. So when I put this socket on, I can't even push it on like that. I have to pull this release to put, put it on. Now, now that that's on there, it's not coming off. I would never dare do that with that other one. And then to get it off, you just pull it off, pull it back, and like that easy. Good tech tip. And with Christmas right around the corner, wives, if you have husbands that are handy, they'll love it. If you have husbands that aren't handy, get a divorce, get a husband that is handy, and get them one of these. Um, I couldn't find my small picks. You need a pick. This is a large pick, so this might work. If it doesn't work, I've got another mechanic's secret weapon. A screw. Just a regular old screw. If you need to get an O-ring off and you can't get it off with a big pick, you'll get it off with a screw every time. Plus, the threads are kind of nice because they grab onto the O-ring. You'll need a, a special Toyota tool. I think they call it a filter wrench. Okay, so this has three notches on one side and one notch on the other. Now, some of them, you can see where this one has cutouts where there could be two others. Those are for different Toyota filters. I don't need to cut those out because this works on the RAV4, so I'm good. You can also use a bigger wrench on the outside of it. So if you don't have a socket wrench, you can do the whole thing. You can do this whole oil change with a crescent wrench, you know, adjustable wrench if you really wanted to. It's always got a little bit of residual oil. I'll always put a paper towel or a shop towel in there. Just when I take it out, like right now, it's completely clean because I'm old and, and I can't remember stuff anymore. So on the filter adapter box, in several places, I've written all the torques, all the specifications. These are the torque specifications, 9 foot-pounds for the housing drain, 18 foot-pounds for the housing itself, which means this one will be to 18 foot-pounds. The drain is on the inside. Then 30 foot-pounds for the oil pan bolt itself. In my best handwriting, the pan bolt is a 14 millimeter. Again, these are just little tips. Funnels are not easy to clean. Um, you'll see a lot of people that have long, narrow funnels. I don't think you can clean those at all. I consider those single use. This one I like because it's very large. And I can actually get in here and clean this out if I have to. Plus, I don't have to worry about the oil backflowing on me. The car takes 0W20, takes 4.6 quarts. This has 5 quarts, so this will be a little bit too much. So I just have to be cognizant of that. Now, I do prefer to use Toyota filters. Why? Because why do you buy a Toyota? There's only one reason you buy a Toyota. That's because it is a Toyota. So personally, whenever I'm replacing anything on this car, I try to replace it with genuine Toyota parts. Even though I prefer Toyota, if you can't get Toyota, these Napa Gold filters, they're pretty good. Let me put it this way. They're the best I can get. This is the single-use drain, which is kind of a neat thing. Toyota's real big on that. Got new O-rings. Both the inner and an outer. And it's kind of nice. It looks like it comes with instructions. Now, these O-rings, I have to keep very clean, so I'm going to put them back in the box. Not bad. Oh, and it's got the torque specifications. I don't know if you can see that. Going to get to work. So now we're under the car. Now, your RAV4 might look a little bit different because there was a plastic skid plate right here. My wife doesn't want me to talk about that. Anyway, right. <laughs> now for any of you guys that are tool aficionados, Craftsman Stainless. That's kind of a limited production thing. All right. So, first thing we do, we make sure we're going counterclockwise. We loosen that bolt. Now, once it's loose, that's when you line up the pan because from here, it's simple. But remember, it's hot. So, have your gloves, have your safety glasses. And have your oil pan ready to catch what comes flying out of here. Now, don't put this bolt back on the ground, whatever you do, because uh, you don't want to pick up all the junk, especially if you're on ground like we are. And again, make sure you get it all nice and clean. And then remember to shift this back, because that oil will shoot that way. But then as, it, as, as the pressure relieves, it'll come back this way. Now, that's the reason. I said there were two reasons I took the oil fill cap off. One so that I know there's no oil in it. Two is because this way the motor doesn't vacuum lock. There's no vacuum holding the oil in, and the oil will actually come out a lot quicker, allowing it to ventilate. Transmission's over here on the driver's side. The engine is on the passenger side. Whatever you do, don't take out the drain plug that's on this side, which is not 
14 millimeter. This one's actually an Allen bolt. Um, if you take out this one, well, things aren't going to go so well. No. Okay, so I've got the oil draining down below. And while I'm waiting for the oil to drain, it's important to maintain patience and to be efficient. So in the meantime, now, antifreeze washer fluid. Many modern vehicles, these are right next to each other. Um, if you put this, actually, if you put antifreeze in the washer tank, it's bad for the environment and animals and that kind of stuff, but you're not going to damage the vehicle. If you put washer fluid in the antifreeze, it's going to cause that antifreeze to, to uh, coagulate. It's going to turn it into jelly. And you could overheat your engine. You could damage your water pump, your hoses, your heater core, which is inside the dashboard. There's all kinds of things that could go wrong if you pour this in the antifreeze. So pay attention. Pay attention. But I want to tell the 12-year-old. Wow. Took almost the whole thing. So. I'm going to towel things down a little bit, make sure I get it good and clean. I'm going to take another look to make sure there's no gasket there. Now, yes, there's still oil coming out, but I'm going to go ahead and put this back in. You always put it in by hand. Don't use a power tool to put that in there. Now, this torque wrench looks like overkill. I'm going to set the torque wrench to 30 pounds, 30 foot pounds. When you hear the click, you'll know you're at 30. Oh, there it is. See? That's it. 30 pounds. Give it one last little wipe. Now we're ready to move on to the oil filter itself. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and drain the filter. For that, we're going to use the 3 8 extension, and we're going to put it on the inner sleeve of the filter. And hopefully the inner one will come out. Yep, good. Okay, now once the inner one breaks free, go ahead and take the wrench off. And we'll go ahead and unscrew this and make sure not to drop it in the oil. Oil really shouldn't come dumping out of here. Yeah, see, just a little bit like that and we're good. Go ahead and clean this up. Okay, now we're going to use our single-use disposable plastic drain and just pop it in there. There we go. And once it pops in, then it go ahead and then it drains. How cool is that? Now that the filter's pretty much done draining, I'm going to go ahead and pop off that disposable little gizmo. So look at that. Popped it off, and it, pu it pulled off the O-ring. We want to make sure that that O-ring comes off. Because another good way to screw up an oil change is to double O-ring something. Okay, so now we're going to take the filter wrench, put it on the 3 8 extension, put that on the wrench, make sure it's set up to ratchet off. After this is lined up, we go ahead and... and Loosen the filter housing. Go ahead and back it off. Now there's an O-ring on there, so it's going to put up a fight. Well, it's going to have resistance for quite a ways. Once I get past the O-ring, it'll get easy. Okay, got easy, so I'm past the O-ring. Now I'll go ahead and bring my oil tank back up. All right. Pop my tool off. Which, as anticipated, has a few drops of oil in it. Go ahead and take it off the rest of the way. And there's our cartridge oil filter. Got it. I'm going to go ahead and put this on the carpet, or on the cardboard, so I'm not making a mess. This is where my pick comes in handy. There it is. There's that O-ring. Go ahead and pull that O-ring off. We're not going to use that again. We'll go ahead and dump whatever oil's left in here. Now we don't have to get too nuts on this, but we still do want to keep things clean. So up here in the comfort of not being under the car, I'm going to go ahead and clean this filter assembly. Now this oil is the dirtiest oil we're going to find because obviously this is where the this is where all the particulates and everything are getting trapped. So we want to go ahead and get as much of the oil out of here as we can. This is the check valve that when I push that plastic piece in. Went ahead and released the oil. And like I said, it dumped out the worst of the worst oil right there. It's really a brilliant design. Not exactly sure how we won World War II some days. You know, I guess Mitsubishi built the Zeros. If Toyota would have built those Zeros, boy, they might have still been running after they did their kamikaze runs. Okay, now we're in reassembly mode. First, we can go ahead and take the oil filter. Now, the oil filter is the same on both sides, so you can't really screw this up. 
as far as how you put it in, but you can screw it up as far as uh, how you install it. You don't want to let it lay like that. You have to pop it in. So when it clicks like that, that's how you know when it's in. Now we've got our drain, our uh, drain cap, and the oil cap, and we have to remember that we got two O-rings that have to that have to go on there first. Now we want to keep these O-rings clean, and I'm a big fan of not putting filters on dry. However, Toyota says go ahead and put it on dry, so I'm going to go with what Toyota says. Now I'm going to go ahead and dip this in here, so I can get some fresh oil on it. I'm going to go ahead and lubricate it all the way around. Now, some people will say put it on there and then lubricate it. However, just like some other things in your adult life, it's always a good idea to lubricate it before you put it on. Anyway, the inner one is going to go on the bottom of the filter housing. But first, I'll put the big one on right over here. It's got a groove that it falls into. Like I said, just leave everything nice and oily. Then we'll turn it over, and we'll take our other O-ring that I also pre-lubricated, and we'll put it in this space, make sure that it's all the way in there and that it's seated properly. See? And it's even all the way around. So then I'll go ahead and take the cap and put it on here. I like to turn it counterclockwise until I feel it click. Once it clicks, then go clockwise. If you do that, you're never going to cross-thread anything. Now just go ahead and get a finger tight like that. Now, we're ready to crawl under, but we're not ready to put it in yet. Because I pulled everything off, but I haven't actually looked, and I haven't actually cleaned it. I'm going to go up here, and I'm just going to go ahead and clean things off a little bit. Okay. Now, you can see everything's nice and clean down here. Again, it's a Toyota, so that's not a big surprise. So, now I'm just going to go ahead and put this back on. And remember that nothing's torqued. So it's going to go on real easy to start with. And again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put it on counterclockwise until it clicks. Boom. Now I'm going to turn it clockwise. Now Toyota puts really big threads on these. So you can see it goes up pretty quickly. I'm going to put it on by hand. Okay, now I'm going to start torquing stuff. I'm going to start with the inner plug. And nine foot-pounds is not a lot. I'm going to tighten this until it clicks. And because it's the lower torque value, it's okay if everything turns. Now that O-ring is seating as I'm going in here, so that's part of why it's going to take a little while. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn it up to 18. I'm going to put my housing adapter back on. Okay, and we're good. And we're ready to put oil back in. Funnel is clean. Now, with the Toyota, there's a backsplash guard. This oil is not going to go in quickly, no matter what I do. See, it's right there. That's as far in as it goes. Really shallow. So, when it comes to putting oil in a Toyota, it takes a little bit of patience. I always clean off the jug. Because the last thing you want to do is set this down on the ground, get a bunch of gravel. Then have the gravel falling off as you're taking your time pouring your oil back in. Now one thing I'm doing is I'm actually watching the side of this to make sure I don't backflow it. Like, you know, this part is a little weird. Toyota says you have to wait 20 minutes before you check the oil level on this after you start it. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and push the dipstick back down in here. I'm gonna towel this off a little bit. Okay, so when I go to start it, I'm going to anticipate that the oil level is going to be low. So I'm going to have a, a warning light somewhere. That should only be for a few seconds, and then it should go away. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start it. The light came on for a second and went off. I don't hear any weird noises. Go ahead and turn it off. Okay, so I'll put it on trip A. Push and hold the display button until it goes to zero. Take this out. Turn it to the on position, and I'll wait for those, those, see it's counting down. Now it went to all zeros. Now the 
Reminder has been reset. Okay. Right in between. So we're good. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. Or if you like seeing mechanical stuff, we got plenty of other stuff we can show you how to do oil changes on. Just let us know in the comments. <laughs>